In MMA news, fighter Cheyenne Bays recently defeated Gloria DePaula with a, a a brutal head kick at UFC Vegas 33. I was just telling Renee, I never want to get kicked in the head for no amount of money. <laughs> After the match, she was given a $50,000 performance of the night bonus, uh, rules of which were recently uh, changed by the UFC. Here's what she said after being asked about what that money means to her and her personal life. I am negative in my account right now, so it's going to make a big difference. And my whole paycheck actually is I have to pay back $15,000 for a loan I got um, from a few people. So, you know, I made 10 and 10 for my win and my win and show. So that 20,000 was just gone. So, and I was okay with it. I was okay if I won and that check was gone. Cause I made the, I made the move out here and I knew that this fight was just going to be for the move, but it was the best decision me and my husband made for our careers. And just to get that bonus, <laughs> I've been so broke my whole life because of this sport, but it's so worth it to me. Now, there's a lot of discussion around this particular story, specifically on how the UFC compensates its fighters to dive into this. We're joined by a senior writer covering combat sports for The Athletic and the co-host of the co-main event podcast, Ben Folks. Ben, welcome. Thanks for having me. So, Ben, I, I'm curious because we've seen a lot of glow-up stories that get glorified. Like, you look at a Conor McGregor he talked about how he struggled for so long before that big fight, and we've heard that same story rinse and repeat over and over. Is this sport fueled by the idea of basically you train, you grind it out, you leverage your future to pretty much make it big? Is that kind of the storyline of this sport? More or less. It's not the kind of sport where, like if you're in the NFL and you're the 20th best tight end in the league, you're a millionaire and you're a sports star. Pro fighting doesn't work that way. If you're the 20th best welterweight in the world, you might have a day job. And that's just the way the pay structure is set up. It's it's very much, uh, I've heard it described uh, sort of like a tournament theory model where to the absolute best, the people who are going to go on and be the, the champions and the big draws, there's a lot of money. But it doesn't mean that there is you know just a little bit step down from a lot of money for everybody else. The, the, the difference between the top and the people slugging it out in the mid-tier is vast when it comes to pay. Dana White uh, is kind of famous for knowing everything about the fighters that take part in his fights. Um, the performance of the night bonus and other bonuses like it um, the, the way they are decided is pretty opaque. Like it's, um, it, how much of those kind of bonuses and awards, um, are just strategic moves by Dana because he wants to center, a, a center, a fighter and has particular plans for them. And how much of it is like, how is that exactly decided? Yeah, it is pretty opaque with the exception that if you miss weight, you can't get one. So that right. takes some people off the list right away. You know, I've seen breakdowns and analyses. Uh, a guy named Reed Kuhn, who is an economist, did a, a look at how likely you are to win a performance of the night bonus based on your position on the card. Because that $50,000 bonus means a whole lot to people on the prelims, people like Cheyenne Bays, who was sort of promoted into the co-main event for this event that, that where she won a bonus based on other fights falling out. She was lower down on the card and she got bumped up when other fights got canceled. And if you're on the prelims, you've either got to do something really spectacular or you've got to hope that nobody else does something all that spectacular right. in order for you to get that bonus. And that 50 grand makes a big difference to those people, especially if you're fighting for 10 and 10 or 20 and 20, you know, uh, 50 grand is going to be the biggest paycheck you get all year. And yet the bonuses typically go to the people near the top of the card, main event fighters, people in the co-main event, you know, those last few fights, they disproportionately get the performance of the night bonuses uh, in actuality. And, you know, sometimes it, it can be sort of an easy call. You see one great fight and not a whole lot of other great fights on the card. Those people are usually going to get fight of the night and it's, and it's kind of a given. And then the other times, you know, there'll be people who have great knockouts, great finishes, great submissions, and they don't get a bonus just because somebody else gets it instead, maybe a bigger name, maybe a, a slightly more memorable finish. And, and that's just kind of how it goes. And I mean, they, they have changed that in the years because it used to be there was one for fight of the night, there was one for submission of the night, and there was one for knockout of the night. And you might have the only submission on the card, and then it's kind of guaranteed yours, or you might have the only knockout, and then it's yours. 
uh, now that they've changed it to performance of the night, I think so that they don't seem to be incentivizing knockouts so much because right. that, that could be a potential liability if somebody <laughs> yeah. brings, a, brings a brain damage uh, lawsuit against you in the future. Now it's a little bit harder to tell exactly how it's going to go. So it's interesting because they changed it to kind of for media purposes, you would think so that it's received better performance of the night instead of knockout of the night. And we saw a lot of those ad outlets use the sound of Cheyenne's interview as almost this heartfelt sentiment about never getting up, overcoming financial obstacles, et cetera, et cetera. But you have a more comprehensive view of this. So can you just talk a little bit about Cheyenne's bonus in the context of what the UFC makes? Right. Well, I, yeah. we tend to do that a lot in the MMA media where somebody yeah. talks about, hey, I was living on ramen and I got this bonus and, and it changed my life. And we go, what a feel good story. And it's kind of like, you know, when kids are having a bake sale to get their mom uh, cancer treatment and you go, OK, it's a feel good story in a way, but also because of a reality that is sort of horrifying. And I've heard it from a bunch of fighters over the years. That $50,000 figure has not changed much in years and years, by the way. It has not really been adjusted for inflation. Every once in a while, they'll bump it up for a big event to maybe 75. But I, you know, I was sitting there 10 years ago, remember, people telling me about I was living on rice and ketchup and I got the $50,000 check and it was a, a big deal for me. But also, it's like when you look at the UFC now, uh, the UFC made over $800 million in revenue last year. It, it's probably going to break a billion here in the next couple years. And they're in this sort of spot where they're trying to tell us somebody like Cheyenne Bays, hey, if you're complaining about what she's paid, look, she's only two fights into her UFC career. She's she's right. six and two as a pro. It makes sense that people on their way up, it's a hard scrabble existence and they're still trying to prove themselves. But yet when you're selling the fight to us, the, the fans and the consumer, she's in the co-main event on ESPN, like a big, big platform. The UFC is making a ton of money for each event that it puts on as part of its UFC or part of its ESPN deal. And so you're telling us on one hand, you know, she's not worth more of your money yet, but she is worth our attention. And so it, it creates kind of a like a weird situation where the fans can rightfully ask, look, is, is this person good or not? Do, do they matter yeah. or not? Are they, a, are they a serious pro athlete at the top of their sport or not? Because you sell them to us as if they are, but you pay them as if they're not. Yeah, and I think the other part of that equation that I'd love to, to get your, your take on it is Length of career. I mean, there's been a lot of numbers bandied around. Uh, you know, I've seen the average length of career from one source being like something like 35 fights total, sometimes 20 something fights, sometimes higher. Six fights is by whatever number, by that average metric, is a significant portion into the career of, of a fighter. So on the one hand, yes, you know, you're, you're just making your way into a, into, a, into a career. On the other hand, if you're only going to fight 35 fights in your career, one fight is huge. That is, that is a huge chunk of your career. So how, can, how, would it, how can these fighters possibly uh, leverage their careers in order to make more money? Like what would it, what would it, what would it take and what... And how does the UFC manage to get away with paying them so little? Well, yeah, that's a, it's kind of like a complicated answer. But I mean, the short sure. answer to that is collective action is what they would need right. in order to really change their situation. They need some kind of collective bargaining. They need like an organization to speak for them. And that would take them getting together and unifying in a way that they haven't really shown any real ongoing willingness to do. That's that's one of the easiest ways that they could do it themselves, but it's tough. They're not naturally inclined to trust one another, and every time we've seen somebody try to come up with some sort of uh, unionizing effort or, or collective action effort, there's always a question of what is in it for that person, if we can right. really trust them. And the UFC has been, at times, notoriously uh, sort of like vindictive against fighters who have stepped up and said, I'm not being treated well, or I don't want to sign this contract. I mean, years ago when they were trying to get everybody to sign away their rights for a video game deal and not offering anything for it, just saying, we're adding this onto the contract. You sign away your likeness rights in perpetuity. And when one of the fighters spoke up and said, mm, I'd like to talk about that and like see what that is actually worth to you, they cut him. 
And then they said, you know, we're going to cut his teammates too. None of, wow. none of those guys from that gym wow. will fight here. And, he, you know, he signed it pretty quickly after that. And the UFC wow. has gotten really used to being able to do that. And the, the only other thing that seems like a realistic path to them getting a better deal out of it is right now there's an ongoing antitrust lawsuit against the UFC that it seems like the, the, you know, the class action uh, element of it is going to be certified. It's been moving forward, just creaking along slowly on the, the wheels of justice for a long time now. But it does seem to be making some progress. And if that keeps going and that, that class gets certified, that could become a serious problem for the UFC. Because that's what you see in other sports is antitrust has often been the avenue toward mm. collective bargaining. And uh, that's mm. that's one way that the, the UFC fighters could get it. But a, a lot of it is that they're very used to this being the way it works. They've seen this the way it works. They, they've gotten used to it. They've, they've heard this message and they've sort of accepted it. And they say like, all right, it's going to be... Uh, a really tough existence that the pay is going to be pretty bad but I'm going to be a champion because you don't get into this kind of sport if you don't think you can be the absolute best there's no there's not a real percentage in being a pretty good pro fighter you know it's you you better think that you're going to be a champion and that's where the real money is and sometimes they tell themselves like okay I just gotta sit through this for a little while and then I'll get the belt and then it'll all be a, a gravy train. Kind of that, that thing that John Steinbeck said about there being no poor people in America, only temporarily disgraced millionaires. And that's sort of how <laughs> fighters think of themselves. Like, I, yeah. I'm going to get the belt and then it'll all be different. So, but I'm curious because, first of all, when I hear the P word perpetuity, that's terrifying. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting that they even just said that out loud that we're using it forever to offer nothing but i know that you did a survey of the fighters in 2020 what was their biggest issues like what what are the things that bother them the most yeah well, we did a, a really big wide-ranging survey with my colleagues and i at the athletic and among the the questions we asked and we tried to get a real cross-section of fighters from organizations and different countries and uh, all kinds of weight classes and everything and when we asked what's the worst part about being a f pro fighter I think it was around 70% of them said some version of the money. And either it was just that the pay is not good enough or that the pay is not consistent enough. There's so many variables in trying to determine how you're going to be paid as an MMA fighter because you sign a deal and, you know, maybe you feel like you're getting a pretty good paycheck at like 50 and 50, you know, where you think, hey, I'm getting 100 grand to fight every time. I mean, if you win. You are, you know, you might go in there and feel like you did a really good job and the judges don't give it to you. you. You lose a split decision and then you go home with half your paycheck. And there's also the chance that you might show up on fight week and your opponent uh, goes to the hospital during the weight cut or gets injured at the last minute, you know, the week before the fight. Or especially during uh, the pandemic, there was a whole lot of last minute COVID positives that scratched people's fights. And you might have gone into debt just getting enough resources to train for this fight. You got to train usually for six to eight weeks for training camp. Yeah. A lot of them, that means, you know, they are, they're not working their day jobs during that. They got to eat specialized diets, pay their coaches, their nutritionists. Uh, fighters go out of pocket for all those costs. It's not like the NFL where your coaches are, are paid for by the team. You know, you, you have to arrange all that for yourself. And then the fight might not even happen. And you, maybe they'll give you the show money if it, if it falls apart at the last minute. They don't necessarily have to. There's so many of those unknowns built into their lives. And so they've said that over and over again, you know, they love it. They love doing it. But the pay is absolutely the worst part. You, uh, you mentioned collective action as a... As a you know, the most direct route towards something like pay equity. Um, another way would be if the stars in the sport lent their support to something of this effort. And of course, as you mentioned, uh, just the structure of the sport, one-on-one -on -one competition, they're not apt to do that. Um, but, you know, obviously Conor McGregor, an extremely toxic individual, is probably the most recognizable, biggest star in the UFC. Uh, Forbes has him as the highest earning athlete of 2021 above Messi, Ronaldo, LeBron James. Um, why he's, he's one for f three in his last four fights. Why is the UFC so centered still on McGregor? Uh, what is it about him that has allowed him to like elevate himself through this sport into a level of superstardom that we've not really seen in the UFC before. What what was what's the what's the secret sauce there? 
I think it's a few different things, man. You, you mentioned the UFC really wanting to center him, and it's because it's uh, the fight promotion business is a sales business, and that's that's what determines you know it's a, who sells pay per views, who sells tickets. Uh, the goal is you know a butt every eighteen inches on fight night, and who whoever brings that that crowd in, that's the guy who we're going to pay a lot of attention to. McGregor got a lot of help at least at first because he basically had an entire nation behind him. He very early on, Irish fight fans were really excited about him even before he was in the UFC. Now that's how the UFC even heard about him was Dana White going to like an event in Dublin, not even a fight related event, and people just kept asking him when are you going to sign Conor McGregor, and the UFC did something for Conor McGregor that it doesn't do as much anymore is that they really set him up for success. Some helpful matchmaking early on, but also really putting him in the spotlight and telling people right away, this guy is a big deal. Like this guy has that star potential and you should care about him. And he did a really good job of maximizing those opportunities. You know, a lot of like great performances, great quick finishes, all that kind of stuff. And just did a really good job building a personal brand that people were into, even when it was inconsistent at times. It was just this kind of swaggering Irish superstar. Uh, I think, I mean, one thing is that uh, the fight world for a long time, it keeps loving the opportunity to find a great white hope. And Conor McGregor comes along, this, this white Irish guy, and they felt like, okay, here's a guy that we can really sell. And, you know, you mentioned him being on the Forbes list a lot of that is not fighting money that they are, are talking about. Right. There. That, his, a lot of that. It's his, it's his liquor line. It's right. His other, yeah, it's his other stuff. And, yeah. and he's done an excellent job with that. Like he and his management team at Paradigm, Audi Attar, have done a great job with that whiskey. Because when I was at his, his most recent fight against Dustin Poirier in Las Vegas, you see people walking around the arena wearing proper 12 whiskey merchandise. Wow. As if it's wow. just a Conor McGregor t-shirt. You know, they're wearing the hats. They're wearing the t-shirts. Like the the brand has become has has been so synonymous with him that it's their way of showing support is to go out there and rep this whiskey brand and that's something you don't you don't see a lot of fighters have that kind of success wow. with a, a sort of like a, a thing that they're branching off into on the side. Wow. Well, he's the combat sports senior writer for the Athletic. Check out his podcast, co-main event. Ben, thanks for joining us on Take Line. Thanks for having me.